Hello, I'm here today to, to tell you about a beautiful set of books that I've read, which was not only entertaining, well-written, but for me, in some ways, a deeply spiritual experience. The books I'm talking about are a set of five books about Sister Mary Baruch, and they're published by Tan Publishing Company. Uh, they're, the first four are still in stock. Number five is, seems to be hard to get. It tells the story of a Jewish convert who turns to Catholicism after the death of a friend and becomes a nun, a contemplative nun. And it speaks about, it takes place in New York and Brooklyn. It talks about the city, it talks about vocations, it mentions death, it the characters are rich, uh, it's a good read, and I enjoyed it so much that I sought out Father Restrick. Now, Father Restrick wrote the books, he's a Dominican priest. Let me read to you what it says, Father Restrick, Jacob Restrick, OP, is a Dominican friar of the province of St. Joseph. He served for over a decade as chaplain to communities of contemplative Dominican nuns. And it was out of that experience that he wrote the books. Uh, originally it was supposed to be sort of a gift uh, to the nuns, a Christmas gift, and did, he did not expect it to be published and so widely read. So I was so enthused with the books, so enamored of the books, that I decided to find Father Restrick and interview him. He works in Hawthorne, New York, which is about 35 miles north of New York City. He works with the Dominican Sisters of Hawthorne. The foundress uh, was the daughter of Nathaniel Hawthorne, the famous uh, American writer. And this specific charism is to work with people that have terminally ill cancer. And I've been up to the, uh, the interview takes place at the Hawthorne residence. It's a beautiful place. Uh, it's set in a lovely setting immaculate but um, the patients there of course have incurable cancer but the thing I noticed in the afternoon and the day that I spent there was the nuns serving those poor and dying are so filled with joy it's a special place it's a beautiful place and I encourage you to look up uh, the Hawthorne Dominican Sisters of Hawthorne they have a video about their history, about the foundress. And I was fortunate to spend a day there and to speak with Father Restrick about these books. Um, if you like to read and it, at the same time gain some spiritual insight, it's based on many years of Father being in contact and community with semi-cloistered nuns. So I hope you enjoy this interview. I hope you buy the books and enjoy the books like I did. I recommended them to my sister-in-law. I gave, the, gave her a set for Christmas and she loved it. And I'm hoping that you will have the same experience when you meet Sister Mary Baruch. It starts in the 1960s and comes up almost to the present day. It's about a beautiful life, as I said, beautifully written with some deep spiritual insights. So enjoy and enjoy the interview. God bless you. So that was my idea for a Christmas gift for the nuns. I would write her story. So Father Restrick, thank you. Thank you for meeting with me. Thank you for having me, for coming here. Um, let's begin with a prayer. Let's say a prayer, a Hail Mary for, for each other, for the order, for all of the women who reside here. Very good. And for all of the listeners, whatever intentions they may have. Good. Hail Amen. Mary. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail, Hail Mary, Mary, full of grace, grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed, blessed art thou among women, women, and blessed, blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mary Mother, Mother of God, God, pray for us sinners 
now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Lady Seat of Wisdom. Pray for us. In the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Father. Tell us about the books. How did it happen? How did it begin well, to? Well, I was chaplain at the time to cloistered nuns in, I believe it was in Buffalo, New York. It was around in 19, the end of the 1990s. But I, I would go different places and give retreats. And so I was giving a retreat to the cloistered nuns in West Springfield, Massachusetts. And it was Monday of the second week of Advent. And I'm reading the readings for Mass for the next day, and I said, what would a cloistered nun make of these readings? You know, how, how could she identify with this? And so on the spot, I made up a sister, and I was going to quote from her journal that she was writing about the readings. And because it was from Isaiah, she almost became Sister Mary Isaiah. But for some reason or other, she in the talking about her, she was a secretary, and Baruch was a secretary, and wasn't a popular name, Baruch. So I named her Sister Mary Baruch. And the sisters like that, because it's almost kind of funny, mm -hmm. Baruch. Uh, so I gave the homily, and quoting from Sister Mary Baruch's uh, journal, and they liked it. They identified with it very much. And so she would appear in homilies after that. And I went back to Buffalo, and Sister Mary Baruch became a part of their community. And then I would meet with older sisters, and they would tell me about the early days. And they did this, they did that. They built the new monastery. They couldn't look out the windows. We went in the certain refectory that we were allowed to have meat, and things were piped into us. So that all came part of the story of young Sister Mary Baruch. And then eventually a sister said, you know, you ought to just tell us her, the whole story of her family, her life. How did she come, come, become a nun to begin with? So that was my idea for a Christmas gift for the nuns. I would write her story. And, uh, and there it is, the early years. Mm -hmm. And why New York City? Well, I kn knew New York. Uh, I had moved from Buffalo then to West Springfield, and Sister Mary Baruch became a member of the community of West Springfield. So when I wrote the book, she couldn't... I didn't want to make her a nun in either one of them, because they were both possessive of her. So I made up a, a completely different monastery. And because I knew New York, I loved New York, I lived in New York as a layman for a time, and so I made it Brooklyn, New York. We do have a monastery in the Bronx, mm -hmm. so, so this was in Brooklyn. For me, as a native New Yorker, yeah. Father, it really came through that, and I told you this, that taste of New York. You could, I thought that you were in, the way New York is presented, the way it changes over the course of the five books, the observations, I felt that you were real. I said, he's a real New Yorker. He knows it from the inside out. It was yes. well done, that aspect yes. of it. I enjoyed. Yeah, it's good. Good. Even people that don't know New York uh, know about New York. And so they, they don't, can't put things together like Mount Sinai Hospital and, and mm -hmm. Central Park and Fifth Avenue. But people that are from there can identify with that. I'm here at, at Rosary Hill right now with uh, cancer patients, and we had a Jewish lady who was a patient, and she heard about Sister Mary Baruch. She couldn't read herself because she, her cancer had advanced, but she was still very articulate. She was good. I said, would you like me to read it to you? And she said, oh, yes, but she was from New York. So Mary Baruch, as a lay woman, was, was uh, Rebecca Abigail Feinstein, mm -hmm. and she grew up on West 79th Street between Columbus and Amsterdam. This patient grew up on West 82nd Street between Columbus and Amsterdam. She says, I know that neighborhood like yes. my, it's my own. So it, she became a great fan of, of Becky Feinstein. That's an interesting, uh, the vocation itself, I know, 
Becky Feinstein, of course, she came from a Jewish, a devout Jewish family. And uh, the, the, different, the way you handle the different people inside that family, I thought was very interesting. She um, was, she was, uh, you said devout. I think it was devout that they kept uh, Shabbat and they kept the High Holy Days, but they weren't Orthodox okay. Jews. They kind of kept a kosher kitchen, but they weren't, they weren't super Orthodox. I guess I was thinking about her dad. He seemed to be the most devout. He was the most devout, right? Yeah. Right. And eventually, I don't know if I should give any spoilers, <laughs> but this, the, the family itself, I wanted to ask you about the mystery of vocations, because in that family we have one of the daughters turns out to be, um, you know, a lesbian. Another yes. daughter turns out to be she get she has an overdose, and right. she the dies. Daughter or her sister is wants to be an actress, and she becomes a, a singer and a dancer and a right. stand-up comic, and and lives in New York and knows that whole life in New York. Right. Uh, which can be tough, it can be cruel, yes. that life is, can be yes. indifferent. Yes, and she never made it big, you know, like so many right. struggle to. But she and, and Becky, which was Sister Mary Baruch, shared a bedroom when they were growing up, and they had on their wall the uh, theater masks of, of mm -hmm. tragedy and comedy. Yeah. And comedy. Yeah. And they, they had a tin, I think, a coffee tin, where they saved their money and they went to Broadway shows or to the movies. They talked about mm -hmm. the theater. Mm -hmm. So it was a part of their life in New York. Well, yeah, t for me, the two of the main threads that I picked up was the life in the theater and this mystery of vocations. You know, getting back to the mystery of vocations for a moment, one of the nuns who came in later in the book, she came in, I think, with green hair and a no <laughs> pierced nose and when I was introduced when I first met her I said oh this is going to be trouble why well, was a teacher for, for many years uh -huh. in New York City in high school uh -huh. and I saw a girl with green hair and a pierced nose I would say oh I'm going to have my hands full and yet this girl becomes a devout nun yes and so I so it taught, taught me a lesson when I was reading that it taught me a lesson not to judge because I judged her as soon as I saw her in the book. That's right. Did you want to say anything about the mystery of vocations? Uh, Becky herself became, you know, from the Jewish family, became Catholic, and then she eventually became Sister Baruch. No, it, it, it happens gradually. If you recall, she even uh, kind of shied away from thinking about becoming a nun. It was an, enough that she became a Catholic. That was a big step in her life but she was devout she she admired her older sister who went to Barnard College and became a journalist and Becky wanted to become like her sister of course she was the smarter one of the Feinstein girls as, mm -hmm. as a part of the, uh, the family Ruthie was her younger sister who she identified with the whole theater uh, thing uh, the, Ruthie goes off into the theater. That's her vocation. Becky could have. She kind of fantasized, I think, of being a journalist with the theater and traveling and mm -hmm. uh, being, you know, having the special seats at the theater. So that was always a part of their life. In the early part of the book, they have you have the uh, they went to see Fiddler on the Roof, mm -hmm. and it was the anniversary of their parents. Mm -hmm. And that's when they got the news a week later of their youngest brother, Joshua, who was killed in Vietnam. Yes. So that's all a part of the period. It's yes. In the 60s yes. in New York. The older sister, who wants to be the journalist, kind of falls in with the anti-war feminist movement at the time. Uh, Ruthie is off on the whole theater thing. Joshua dies. Mm-hmm. And so Becky is, you know, taking all of this in as she's in high school and, and college. She's in college now, the end of the 60s. She's friends with Gracie, who is a nice Gentile girl, mm -hmm. uh, wanted to be a teacher or a model. 
uh, yeah. she was she was blonde, blue eyed, thin. Becky was kind of short, a little stout, Jewish. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's interesting how amidst all of this, you know, you mentioned the Vietnam War and even her friend who who dies, then that that, that there's a separation that 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 hurt of the separation, the loss when her friend her dies. Brother. And her brother, right? And yet, oh, Gracie that dies. Yes, yeah, Gracie. When Gracie right. dies, and of course her brother dies. That's another blow. But amidst all this, God's grace pierces through all this, and she's called to a life of intimacy in a special way with 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 God. And I find that to be very beautiful. That amidst the suffering and the pain, God is there yes. still, and yes. she answered. With all that she was going through, she be, she was open. To God's grace, even though she didn't even know it. Right. Uh, she didn't plan it. It, it unfolded right. gradually. That's right. One she door opened. She went to Mount Sinai to visit her girlfriend, who was, uh, they find out, has leukemia. She was the runner. Right. And she can't get in to see her because it's too early. So she goes out for a walk and she says, I should buy her something. I'll go to Bloomingdale's and get something very nice. And that's when she walks down and she, she's in front of this big church and uh, it's on 65th and Lexington. St. Vincent Ferrer. That's right. And Which is my favorite church. And yeah. I told you that. It's yeah. a beautiful it church. Is. It is. How could you not have a conversion <laughs> in that church? <laughs> it's says, gorgeous. I'll go in and, and uh, get, I'll light a candle for her. That was the, a moment of grace in a way. Yes. Her lighting that candle in front of the statue of Jesus in the, of the Sacred Heart in priestly vestments, which she had no idea what, what that was. But she was very moved by that, the look on his face. And she, she sat down in the pew and kind of stayed there for a couple hours. Uh, that was the moment of grace for her. And she she thought it was so beautiful, the church. Mm -hmm. And so she decided she would come back and she picked up her pamphlets. And that was the beginning. Yeah, I remember that scene well because I know that church. And it, it as I said, architecturally, it's a masterpiece. And it's very, the way the, way the windows light up when the sun comes through that beautiful blue. Yes, yes. And even when it's dark, it's very, it's, 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 it's conducive to prayer, I think. I wanted to touch upon the theater aspect as well, because a lot of people in your books are involved in the theater. We already mentioned Ruthie, uh, there's Sister Gertrude, certainly, and there are others. And uh, what Are you trying to make any connection there between, what are you not, trying to tell us? so intentionally in the beginning, except that one that it was in New York. And so there was always the theater, uh, love for the theater and the connection. But I know of people that are in the theater, and that are in religious life, and there's a passion for both of them. And people will have an idea that the theater is all very wonderful and, and they're all very good and it's a wonderful life. They don't know the passion and the hardship and the sacrifice behind it. The same with religious life. You look at the cloistered nuns, oh, it's beautiful. They're lovely sisters. They're very happy praying together. There's a real life of sacrifice that goes on in their life and mm -hmm. death to the self. Yes. And so there's a, there's a similarity. Even though the theater is made up, the religious life is not made up. It's for real. Mm -hmm. But it, it has a lot of that the same uh, surrender and kind of spiritual sacrifice the passion for it. You have to give your life to it. Right. It has to be a passion. So if you, you, you don't get a job in the theater, you don't quit, you go on to the next audition. In the monastery, uh, you're humiliated, you're set back from your first vows, you don't quit, you go on. Mm -hmm. it's, there is a similarity. Mm -hmm. So in the monastery, she meets, because it's New York again, one sister who knows what she's talking about, understands her sister. She's used to be a tap dancer herself. Right. And she says it more than once that she decided it wasn't the broad way, but the narrow way that she wanted. Right, right. 
and and she has her own conversion story of late at night with a single light burning on the stage and she leaves the theater uh, and and stands at the corner of Broadway and all of the lights and she knows this isn't for her yeah that there has to be more to life yes where are you from I'm Ukrainian uh, okay. I was in the Peace Corps Is and that's that how right? yeah and we met when I was serving in the Peace Corps uh -huh. in Ukraine. That was in 2000, we were married. I applied to the Peace Corps. You did? I, I wanted to go to Thailand. And oh, wow. They, uh, they sent me to Korea. They were going to send me to Korea. And I said, that's like MASH, uh, Korea. And uh, I didn't want to go to Korea. I wanted to go to Thailand. Okay. So I didn't, I didn't go. Wow, and it changed your life, though. That's right. That's right. Even in that. Right. What year would that have been? Oh, I'd, I'd have to think about that. Probably in the 70s, 1970s. Okay. Yeah, wow. They, sent, they said to me, during, maybe they changed the interviews over. Where was your interview? In New York? I don't remember. Okay, maybe. Because uh, they said to me, where do you want to go? I said, well, I'd like to go to Eastern Europe. Why do you want to go there? Well, I taught in Poland already, and I'm interested in that. So they, they gave me Ukraine, and I accepted. Uh -huh. But I wanted to read this from, this is from your book. It's the intro to part one in book five. Which is a quote from the Constitution, right? Of the nuns. Yes, yeah. Appointed for the work of divine praise, the nuns in union with Christ glorify God for the eternal purpose of his dispensation of grace. They intercede with the Father of mercies for the universal church, as well as for the needs and salvation of the world. And that's from the Constitution of the Nuns. So my question is, if there are less nuns, then there are less prayers and less intercessions and support. So is this a downward spiral? I guess so. I haven't thought of it in that sense. Certainly the contemplative life the monastic life and the life of the nuns is one not of activity of right. the apostolate, but one of a deep prayer interceding for the salvation of souls. I often think of the nuns sitting up at night. I think I have some of them doing this in the night guard, praying for the people that are out wanting to sin, that are lost, that are right. sick, that are going to work that somebody's praying for all these people. Yes. You'll have somebody come to confession. I've had this too. It's been 35 years since my last confession. I said, there must be a cloistered nun somewhere. Yes. It's grace pushed you into this confessional. Yes. So because there's less nuns, there's less of that activity going on, yes. I believe, Father, that the nuns, the cloistered nuns and brothers and priests, they sustain the world with their prayers. Yes. It keeps us yes. going. It does more good than we could ever measure. That's right. That's right. And so that's why vocations are very important, when because when we have less nuns and praying for us. It's certainly not being promoted today. There are vocations to that life. Uh, because if I heard a, a Dominican archbishop now say about the young men coming to the Dominican order, he says, that generation have been to the abyss and they see yes. the emptiness of it all. Oh, yes. And they want something that's real. Well, the monastic life, the cloistered life, is the reality at its depth. You can't get much more real than that. Right. So it takes a while for Sister Mary Baruch to, herself to see that. But it's that giving of your whole life and to Christ. There's that relationship with the Lord. It's a spousal relationship. You know, also, the, I wanted to touch upon the mystery of evil because in the books there is someone who comes into the cloister and... Um, under satanic influences. That's right. And there has to be an exorcism. What, what can you say? I mean, how do we even begin to think about the mystery of evil? Yes. It's present, certainly, it's, and it's, um, 
it's very prevalent in in our world in the in the atheistic culture that we live in it, the devil is the prince of the world and we see it all around us really uh, so the devil is going to get at places where that deep spiritual life is being lived he, that's they're under attack as it were it's done very subtly um, and, I, and I've, I've seen it in a very subtle way not as dramatic as it comes out in, in I forget which volume volume three I think yes yeah, three or four the, yeah that person that enters right uh, I was conscious of it because I had taken a course at the time edited or audited a course on exorcism and I lived with an exorcist at the time and I helped uh, assisted at a few so I saw how real this can be and how mm -hmm. real the evil one is in people's lives and so it comes in you can see it in the monastery in a very negative way there's all the D words division um, I don't know other D words the um, doubt Doubt, uh, yes, that's a big disagreement. One. That's right. They're all they all separate. Disunity. Us. That's right. And uh, so I wanted it to come into the to the monastery in a real way, uh, and then have it taken care of, and and it is. Yeah. For those that may be concerned about you know the the evil certainly the evil that is in the world, what is our best protection? against the devil and his satanic forces? Well, I think it's prayer, certainly. Living in the state of grace, you surround yourself with, with protection. And uh, Our Lady certainly says to pray and to pray the rosary and the prayer of St. Michael the Archangel are the great protections mm -hmm. against the evil one. So to live in a state of grace is to receive the sacraments as much as you can, right? Eucharist That's and right. confession. That's right. See, even that expression, to live in the state of grace, people don't know what, you, what that means today. Right. You know, you don't hear it so much in homilies, I guess. It's uh, living in union with the Lord. Yeah. Right. And to do that, what does that look like? When I live in union with the Lord, what does it look like? Well, you're certainly at peace and one with Him, and you, it changes your life. Again, Mary Baruch experienced that from the very beginning. It was the grace of conversion mm -hmm. that, that brought her to the fullness of grace, which comes at baptism. But she knew that union with Christ from the very beginning. And she didn't have the vocabulary. She didn't know what, the, what it was called, but she saw it. She knew it. When she would go to Mass and she'd see people kneeling at communion and then coming back and putting their face at their face in their hands and that silence and union with the Lord moved her. She wanted that. Yeah. And I sense that Sister Mary Baruch had a peace about it and also like a submission. She wasn't aggressive in any way and she wasn't, it didn't have to be her way. That's right. She talks about it from the very beginning, that quiet place within her. Yes. She talks about it. She was almost childlike yes. in some ways. Um, she says she knows in a way, again, the theater thing I just thought of. There's something about in the theater when the, the lights go down and if it's a musical, the uh, pr uh, prologue is played. There's a peace that comes over you at the theater. You, you, you leave your life into it. You go into another world in the theater. Even yes. if it's for an hour and a half, you're in another world. There's a point. And the ballet, I, the dance, I think, does this mm -hmm. too, especially the ballet. There's a point when, during the first time in the books where they have the election of, would it be uh, the abbess? The prioress. The prioress, I'm sorry. The prioress. Um, and she, it looks like she might win, but she doesn't want it. She's very, she, she's not aggressive. She prays for God's will. Right. And, you know, as a reader, you don't know, is she going to win or not? Is this yeah, going to happen or not? I liked yeah. it. 
And, well, the fact that she doesn't win that and it doesn't really bother her is, sim is a simplicity, I think, that she has. Yes. A submission to the will of God. That even in that, she doesn't show this inclination to, I want this, I, you know, I hope to get this. Please, God, let me win this. She doesn't do that. You go through, when you meet uh, Mary Baruch from the very beginning, there's a, a growth in her part in the spiritual life. Right. And it, a lot of it is, is her own self-will and self-centeredness having to let go of that uh, and to accept the grace of the moment. And she does that gradually. It takes time to do that. It's not easy. That's right. That's right. You haven't mentioned the one... Oh, I'm sorry. I shouldn't gesture so much. Yeah, just let's keep, uh, yeah, keep this untouched, okay? Sorry. You haven't mentioned the one character who causes her so much trouble in the beginning. Oh, yes. And whom she and, uh, I forget her name, isn't that awful? Uh, yeah, the the, the other the, sister who was a posh, right. who was a candidate. The prioress, the the original prioress, who was very. No, John Dominic was fine. It was okay. the the novice mistress. The novice Austria. mistress. And they she was Sister Catherine Agnes Russell. Right. C A R. Scar. And they called her Scar. Tell us about her. She was, she was rough. She was very strict. She never laughed, never smiled. Uh, she was stern in that sense. If you're going to have a character play her, she'd be very stern and very observant. And she would humiliate you. And she humiliated Mary Baruch when she went to visit you. She was there for a, a month or two, and it was going to be wonderful. And she she misses the time the first day, and she, she talk to her like she's a child and here she's 21 right. 25 years old and you're talking to me like I'm a child that's all a part of sister Mary Baruch's having to die to herself and scar knew that scar sees that in her wow that's deep I didn't pick and that it up comes out in, in almost in the last book yes uh, she this becomes is comes very close to scar. yes there's reconciliation yeah in a way, right? They become very close. And of course, she constantly w goes to the grave site and asks for advice or prays to her and talks to, to her. Sister Mary Dominic, that is. To oh. Sister John Dominic. Right. Her, the, her, her first prioress whom she loved. No, Scar is still living. Okay, in, right. In the next volume. I'm getting confused, Scar is, right. Scar is in the infirmary, but she's mellowed. And there's always a character, and this is true in monastic life, you know, there's, there are characters in that, in that group. Because you have to be a cloistered nun, uh, it's a very special charism, so you have to be kind of a character. And there's uh, Sister Bertrand, in that who is, who's, doesn't give two hoots about this right. or that. Oh, right, you know. right. She's the character. Then there's Sister Gerard, who's very pious and follows all the apparitions. Uh, mm -hmm. And people make fun of her because she, she does this, including Sister Mary Baruch. At one point, Sister Mary Baruch is reminiscing after she's 30 years now. She's reminiscing about the old days when you weren't even allowed to have a newspaper, for instance. Yes. And now she's talk, thinking about like the access to information that they have. And so what can you say about how the church has changed? What have we gained and lost, let's say, from many people look at Vatican II as a turning point. What has the church gained and lost? Or is that well, even the right this question? This very uh, personal and, uh, uh, in my own opinion, opinionated, that I think with social media, of uh, the com internet, the computer, the cloister has opened up its doors and let the world come in. And that's not good. Right. Uh, I thought of this, I was chaplain to the nuns at the time when 
the sex scandal hit the newspapers, the Boston Globe, I think it yeah, was. Yeah, it was. So yeah. Massachusetts, they're getting the daily newspaper. They're reading things that they don't even, they would confess that they read this uh, yeah. description of what this priest has done. And it, it, it explodes their whole world in a way. And it's coming in through the newspaper. Then they get computers, they get email. Email opens them up again to the world. This right. constant communication back and forth. Right. We know, I know, how emails can become addictive. You know. And a distraction. A big and, distraction, right. And a waste of time. There's so much garbage you have to go through to get something that you really want to look That's at. That's right. Now, there are wonderful things in social media. Yes. And in, in the computer, uh, instant research that you can do. Uh, That's how we found each other. That's how That's I found right. you. That's right. So there's a lot of good. Grace can work through it, but there's a lot of evil that can work through it. So I think that the cloistered nuns need to come to become more traditional. They changed their grill, they took away the grill and had an openness to the world. Well, there's something good about that, but there's also something mystical about their separation from the world. I, uh, I'm familiar with the Trappist life for, for men, and there was a time uh, 50 years ago when you, you couldn't cross a certain line at Gethsemane, for example, and it's under pain of excommunication if you come into this part of the property. But now, at a Trappist monastery, you'll, they'll have open house and people will come in and walk around the chapel and talk and, uh, and men and women together coming on retreat. It's, uh, it's very different from, there was something missing in that old separation mm -hmm. from the world that made a true message that, that they don't have today, that's all. That I had a, a Benedictine nun in Italy tell me she was so grateful that uh, for what Greta went through, because she didn't like Greta, she was too perfect, she was too good. And so she falls and she sins, but she has great contrition and she receives great forgiveness. She becomes a Catholic, mm -hmm. too, Greta. And it was so meaningful for Greta, she, she couldn't even share it with, with uh, Becky at the time. They lived together for five years. Mm -hmm. Only in, the, in her letter does she tell her about her sinful life. Father, if there are themes that run throughout the five books, I mean, what's, what themes do you see that emerge? Maybe they weren't planned, but maybe you, when you look back, these themes emerged. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just thinking now this is off the top of my head as we're talking. Certainly that theme of, well, of the conversion, of, of uh, dying to yourself, all that Becky went through, you know, and she's, she's a character in herself, yes. Becky. Uh, she loves food. Yeah. Food is mentioned a lot in it. Yeah. Uh, she, yeah. uh, she's very Jewish in that yes. part. Uh, but through all of that, she becomes a Catholic. Then there's her great friend who has a very sinful life. There's that theme of sin and forgiveness and God's mercy. Uh, kind of a Mary Magdalene. Not quite as bad as Mary Magdalene. She was not possessed. But uh, she was possessed in a, in a way, I guess, Greta. It was, it was human weakness. She's, she's, she's lonely. She's, she falls in love with this uh, person. And, and Ruthie, her own sister, uh, Becky never really condemns them. She has great compassion for them after the heart of Jesus and the, right. was part of her own conversion. She always sees God's mercy in yes. it all. And yeah. her, father, her mother, you know, for, just not see her mother for 25 years. Yeah. 
Yeah, Sister, ne Sister Baruch never really uh, judges anybody or comes down hard on anybody. She comes right at them with mercy, yes. That's right. She gets upset with people like Scar right. and different ones, and then she'll, as she advances when she's novice mistress, she'll have problems. Then there's 9-11. That's well, another whole theme. I was gonna. I saw that coming, yeah. by the way, uh -huh. with the rooftop, uh, with the you know going up on the yes. rooftop and look. Yes. You you made it a point of describing the beautiful New York City skyline, yes. and I know that area in Brooklyn Heights. I've walked through that. Yes. It's a beautiful right. area. The promenade. The promenade. Yes. It's a very. It's one of the best places to see this the, yes. the skyline. But that brought me to another question: is about death. You know, many people in the book die in different ways. Some tragically, some just naturally. Right. And uh, although it's sad, I, I somewhat like that about the book because it's true to life. We all experience death in life. That's right. What are you trying that's to say about theme, death? I would think. I, I, yeah, that's death. where I'm coming with this. Death is After death, there's the hope of eternal life. I mean, that's what it's all about. Why did God make you? To know him, love him, and serve him in this world? Yeah. Be happy with him forever in the next. What about people like my mother and my brother? What about Papa? What about Joshua? Yeah. What about Ruthie? Right. So she, she prays for all of these people. That, that becomes a part of the offering of herself is for the salvation of their souls. Even a death at the end provides an answer for them with, concerning the house when that actress died. That's right. That's right. She, the actress dies yes. and leaves them a house, and that enables them to move forward. So through that death, there's some sort of a life. That's right. We're hoping there will be another book. Will another there, book? There is. I'm working on six, although it's, okay. I've been working on it for a time. It's, I don't have the time. And I have to almost go back and read what I've written to get myself back in the mindset of it. But it's, there, there should be a volume six. Will Tan, is Tan interested in that? I hope they, they, they are. They don't even know about it. Okay. My contract with Tan is for five volumes. Oh, uh, right. Well, I'm for one, <laughs> I'm hoping that, I'm looking forward to, uh, to the sixth book. What are some of the things that you might be thinking about? Well, it continues with, you know, it's a, giving, the, it's a spoiler. She's in a position of authority in yeah. volume six, and they've That's moved into a new monastery. Right. So there's that whole theme, too, of the lack of vocations, the monastery closing. There are monasteries all over the country that are closed. I know. The one I was chaplain to in Buffalo has has disappeared. They've gone to an, they've went together as a community, and now they're dispersed into different monasteries. Now I understand uh, you mentioned like in Springfield, I think the Passionist Monastery. Is that st is that that's still in there? Buffalo? Okay. The, oh no, in West Point, that's a men's monastery. Yeah, is it still there? That as far as I know. Okay. But it's it's uh, a retreat house, I think. Oh yeah, run by the Passionists. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, Father Ezra is also... Um, yes, he's in, he comes in. He's not young. None of them are young anymore in volume six. And Charbel? Charbel is... Because he's gone through his own... I didn't know what would happen to him. Yes. For one minute it seems like he's going to go this way. The next minute he's in danger with his life even. That's with, right. And then you think he's very, he gains his spirituality, but then again, it turns another way. You have me guessing with yes. Charbel. Yes. <laughs> well, he comes in. He's, he, uh, he comes to their new monastery to see her right after New Year's, and there's a nice talk between the two of them. As well as Mitzi. Mitzi is another whole character. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. That, uh, her, her own sister doesn't make the conversion, uh, but Mitzi does. Which is interesting how right. God works. And that whole theme, that's another whole theme, the lesbian theme, without being strident about it. Uh, again, Mary Baruch doesn't, I don't judge or tell you about your life as you don't judge and tell me about mine. Right. But I pray for you and I don't, I can't accept your life, but I pray for right. you. Right. 
Uh, right, which is, which is a good, the attitude to take, yeah. the attitude that we all yeah. must take. And Mitzi and, and uh, Sally are living a chaste life. Yes, that's, they are. That's underlined. Right, yes. Yeah, that's mentioned more than once. But Mitzi has a whole, Mitzi reminds me of, of uh, uh, Edith Stein's sister. Oh, I don't know anything about Edith Stein's sister. Her connection. Really? That, yeah. I have to look that up when I get home because that's interesting. So what influenced you? In the, you, talk, you, you seem to have many different influences from different places in, in the books. What? Yes, it would be hard to say. I think just from my own life and from my own experience with the cloistered nuns and knowing them in a, in a real way and loving them and admiring their, the ideal of their life, but seeing how real it can be and how, how difficult it can be and how wonderful it can be. When you think about the death you mentioned, there's not much that goes on in their life except uh, the two big things in their life is when they make final profession and when a sister dies because it's all about that. It's all union with the mm -hmm. Lord. Yes. Uh, the death is something wonderful. We've made it to be something very morose and, and we disguise it right. and ignore it and hide it away. People aren't even having wakes today. You know, cremate them and get rid of right. the evidence. Or postpone it as long as you can, even That's artificially right. postpone it. That's right. Now, I also see, especially living here, yeah. how tragic death can be for people, for the ones remaining, letting go of those that we love. And death is a very difficult, it's a part of our life. Yeah. For those that are listening that might be writers, what's, what's your writing process like? Oh, it's, well, it's, 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 it, it varies. I, uh, it, it depends on where I am and what I'm doing, if I have time. Okay. It takes a couple hours. And you, sometimes I just sit down and begin to write and it will come to me as I'm writing. I yeah. don't have too much planned in a, ahead. Writing, I mean, I clearly feel that this is a great success and writing is a little bit like it's a vocation. Some writers have a very you have your priestly duties here at the house, but some writers have a strict schedule. They only write in the morning, or they write at night. Oh, no, and mine it's would be all different times. Yeah, yeah. On, you bring yourself on, to the vocation. Right. right. And I think of it kind of as a long homily. <laughs> it's going. To, it's five volumes now, but it's a long homily, and hopefully it will make you laugh and make you cry and make you pray, and make you think about your own life. I have had people tell me, and sisters in active orders, that they use it as spiritual reading. They've, they've reread yeah. it again during Lent because you get more out of it the second time around. You know, you, you see the different characters. I had a, other Dominican friars that read it and they tell me they cry at this part or they yeah. cry at that part. And I'm very moved at that because Dominicans can be very stoic. and you know, intellectual, right? but that, that can touch their heart and they, they get in touch with the emotion of this relationship she has with different people. Uh, it's certainly done all of those things for me, Father. It's yeah. been almost like a prayer, but I've also, it's very funny. I'll read parts to my wife, yes. say, listen to this, you know yeah. what's happening. And so you yeah, bring in characters that can be a little exaggerated and like the, the party on the rooftop, that's, uh, that would make a great production number in a movie. Yeah. But, uh, and the nuns do do little shows like that. They're very creative. Yes, they are. Uh, had another friar who was just talking about 9-11. He was an editor. So before it even went to the publishers, I sent him a copy of the manuscript to read sit the house of studies i see him early in the morning in the in the refectory and he's walking out of the refectory and he sees me and he says you're mean <laughs> <laughs> says i never expected that uh, 
9-11 affected a lot of us. <coughs> it certainly did, yeah. So, and especially New Yorkers. Right. And so it has to affect them. Yes. There's, there's almost too much goes on in the world that I don't bring into the book. Uh, I'm coming up in volume six with the death of the resignation of Pope Pi of Benedict. That's going to be a big change. And the direction that the church is going in happens a lot. She has a real crisis of faith in volume six. And she'll either go along with it and lose it or she'll go a different direction and become uh, more Catholic. Begins with a sister who's dying, a, a Sister Bernadette, who used to be the prioress. And she talks to Sister Mary Baruch and she says, when I die, I want to have a Catholic funeral. And she says, what do you mean? And she explains what what a Catholic funeral was 50 years ago. And that's what I want. Yeah. Father, for those of us that are struggling, like with, the, with maybe the direction we feel the church might be going in, or there are things we don't understand, we see maybe contradictions within the church. Part of it, we have to believe somehow the Holy Spirit's in charge, right? He's directing. The, even this is for a reason, yes. this confusion yes. and this seemingly alienation from the past. Even that is somehow part of the plan. Yes. The Lord says the, ch uh, the church will not fail. Right. The church may, may do, not that word. Uh, the, the gates of hell will not, will not prevail, prevail against, against it. Against it, yes. Uh, it's, there's too much going on there. You can see how, it, how it's going on in, in her life and in the life of the monastery uh, where they've almost lost it all and now there's a revival yes. that will go on. There's the hope that what we're going through now uh, is a death but there's always a resurrection. It's our faith. We know it. It's the life of Christ living his Paschal mystery in us, in his church today. You know, it's, that was one of the questions I had planned. Was I think One of the sisters says that the, the church is at a crossroads. Yes. And I wonder, are we still at the crossroads, and how long will we be standing here? I don't know. I think we're, yeah, we're still at a crossroads. It's even going to get worse, I think. Mm -hmm. But... And it's not just the, the church, the country, and the world. Right. And yet we're in this time, in this place, by God's design. That's right. And how we respond is very important. That's right. So we have to double and down on... you're doing your part. It seems like this is the age of the laity. That the laity are coming out and speaking out and, and evangelizing where the clergy, uh, the hierarchy are silent. That's part of the reason why I have this YouTube channel. It is modest and I give it to God. I'm not looking for a huge amount of followers. Yes. I just like to, hopefully God will use it as a vehicle in which to transmit some grace to someone who may be watching the video. That's right. Something may, may resonate with them they might want to That's look right. at something further. Hopefully That's they'll right. look for your books, read your books. Even even on the form of entertainment, it's a great entertainment. Yes. But there's a spiritual aspect to it. And, and we it, learn from her, I hope, not to lose hope. It's Our Lady of Hope is the name of the monastery. Ah, oh, right. That's true. Yeah. So there's, and, and it's always a recourse back to prayer. If you keep that intimate union with the Lord in prayer, an adoration with a, the Eucharist as the heart and center of, of our life, the beginning and the end, the, the Eucharist, and the Mass then takes on a whole new uh, impetus in our life. And Mary Baruch is going to come to see that in a way that she doesn't right now. But she has to let go, and that's going to be painful. Because not everyone's going to go along with her. 
Well, thank you very much, Father. Maybe even not Ezra. Oh, my gosh. But wow. Maybe he will. Okay. Or All right. Maybe he'll die. Wow. Who knows? The, it'll I be, don't know. I don't right. know myself. Right. So. As you write it, 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 it sort of, you won't know until you actually start to write it what's That's going right. to happen. It'll That's reveal right. itself. Right? That's it right. reveals itself. You don't have it planned from A to Z. That's right. That's right. When she first met Mitzi, had no idea what was going to happen with Mitzi. Right. Yes. Do you remember her mother? And, uh, used to, and she used to laugh about uh, Sally and her girlfriend that, that give dogs haircuts. Yes. Yes. Does she look like a basset hound or a, a poodle? Right. I remember that. Yeah. yeah. And now Mitzi seems to be, there's, there's, Mitzi's interested, in, Mitzi's coming around. That's right, right. She's becoming very faithful. And that revealed itself as you wrote the book. That's right, that's right. And it, it still does. Is that from God? I don't hope so. Yeah, that's a, is that like an inspiration from? I would hope, because even people that like yourself and others that have read it and they've talked to me that this moved them or that moved them. I didn't intend that when I wrote it. So the Holy Spirit works through it. Yes. Uh, I just lay the I just lay the groundwork, the Holy Spirit. Do you pray before you sit down to write? Not all the time, but I do and yeah. while I'm writing it. I like to write. I, I got to get into the habit to say, Holy Spirit, take my work. And lots of my own adoration time with the Eucharist can be very distracting because I'm, I'm there. I'm still thinking what's going on. What's Sister Mary Brewer going to do? What's Mother going to say? Uh, and I'm supposed to be praying, but it's going on in my head. So I just let it happen. Thank you, Father, for You're meeting welcome. with us. Thank you very it much. It was a pleasure to get to talk for, uh, to you and get to know for your you. Your enthusiasm to yeah. know Becky Feinstein. God bless you and thank you for this this gift. Thank you. You're an incentive to continue with volume six. I can't wait. <laughs> the brothers say volume ten will be Sister Mary Baruch the cause. Right. Exactly. Right. <laughs> Good. God bless. Thank you, Father.